This is Andy Gutierrez from StarWars.com, and you are listening to Coffee with Kenobi with Dan Z. This is the podcast you're looking for. This is James Arnold Taylor, and you're listening to Coffee with Kenobi. Hmm, I have a good feeling about this. Joining us today for a cup of coffee is the award-winning movie critic at WTOP in Washington, D.C., and the host of the Beyond the Fame podcast. Please welcome to Coffee with Kenobi, Jason Fraley. Hey, thanks so much for having me. Uh, it's a privilege, and uh, I actually am. I did bring a coffee to the party, so I am living up to your title. <laughs> I love it. I love it. So good. Well, you've already passed the first round of the auditions. Let's see how this goes, but I'm very optimistic. I've been, we've been talking before. I've been a big fan of yours for a while. I heard you on the Tony Kornheiser show at the movies with Arch and Ann. I absolutely love your Twitter account, and you're like an encyclopedia of movies so it seemed perfect to have you on to talk about the 40th anniversary of raiders and star wars and of course all that good stuff oh it's perfect yeah man uh, dan you you and i are, are are in that you know that there's like best friend twitter friends who've actually never met in person but <laughs> I've yes admired, i've admired your stuff from afar and i uh, love what you're dig what you're doing in chicago you know i'm in dc but uh it's it's cool that we could hook up and, and talk about two of the greatest franchises ever Oh, I, I, I'm, I'm very, very excited. I was talking to my wife about how we're going to chat. And so the first thing I want to talk to you about, I mean, we're, I was going to talk about Star Wars originally, but we just had the 40th anniversary of, in my mind, obviously I'm a Star Wars guy, but to me, Indiana Jones is the greatest fictional movie character of all time as far as just the entertainment and the awe that he just brought to so many faces. It seems like if, if you're a certain age, that is your movie. What was it like for you the first time you saw Raiders of the Lost Ark? Man, I actually, I think I would agree that he's the greatest uh, fiction character. He's my childhood hero. Um, in fact, the American Film Institute, and it's been a few years ago now, but back around the turn of the millennium when they did all their, you know, top 100 best series, um, they ranked uh, Indiana Jones as the greatest, second greatest hero of all time. They had Atticus Finch number one. You know, it's hard to, hard to, hard to argue, you know, the, the social... Agreed. Uh, Agreed. Of that. But in terms of like an action adventure hero, come on, it's Indiana Jones. He beat out, you know, uh, James Bond and all these other famous characters. He was he was the, the top sort of action guy on there. And um, yeah, I mean, the reason I say he's my childhood hero is these are the movies I grew up with. Um, I, uh, you know, you mentioned you asked the first time I saw Raiders. Uh, I unfortunately I was born in, in 1984. Um, so I missed raiders when it was you know first in the theaters in 81 so i was i was a temple of doom baby because i came out the year <laughs> of temple of doom <laughs> so i i'm pretty sure that's the first one i saw i have these childhood memories of being scarred uh, you know when they when he you know he pulls the heart out of the chest i mean i oh, just yeah. remember being watching that at a way too young of an age like in in one of my cousin's basements you know <laughs> and being like uh, this is terrifying, but I love this character, Indiana Jones, on the rope bridge and everything. So then I pretty quickly after that, I was able to sort of double back to um, Raiders of the Lost Ark. I remember they this will show how times have changed. They they were selling the VHS trilogy at McDonald's of all, of all places. I remember that. I remember yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, here's a happy meal and here's the, the greatest trilogy ever. <laughs> um <laughs> But um, so so yeah, like uh, we when we got those um, on VHS, then I doubled back and watched Raiders and absolutely loved it. Of course, we watched Temple Doom again, and then you know my favorite as a kid was was Part Three was uh, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade because you know as a kid you got to the, the quest for the Holy Grail was so much fun and just the novelty of having you know, Harrison Ford and Sean Connery together with that father-son banter. <laughs> Don't call me junior. Um, I, I absolutely, I absolutely loved it. And, you know, what better, who better to cast as Indiana Jones's father than James Bond? Rest in peace, Sean Connery. But, um, but yeah, like, so, so as a kid, I always loved, um, I, I always loved uh, The Last Crusade and, um, my it's funny um, in in high school my buddies and i even would you know you know how you do with your home home movie cameras we even made some spoofs uh, and i i played a role called illinois smith it was like a mel brooks <laughs> it was like a mel brooks spoof. um it, it was, we could find them somewhere they're probably embarrassing now but uh but yeah so i was the last cruise uh, originally in a temple of doom kid because that's the first i saw and then i loved last crusade and uh but i think the older i got um 
you know, and, and started studying film a little more seriously. Um, I, 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 I came around to the notion that there's a reason that Raiders of the Lost Ark is the one that everyone, all the list makers put on the list to represent the franchise, because it really is the one that started it all. It's got the most iconic opening. It's got the most iconic ending. It's, it's, it's really, it invented everything. It's the first time we ever heard the Raiders March by John Williams. So, I mean, I really think, I, I do think that that one is the, the seminal work in, in the thing. Oh, I agree. I, I, I've told this story several times, but I just, even when I tell it, I get the same reaction. I remember as a kid, uh, my dad saying, Hey, you want to go see that new, that new Indiana Jones movie? And I said, well, who is that? And then, and they said, well, remember that trailer we saw before the Muppet movie? Oh yeah. It had Steven Spielberg in it, which I always equated with. If I saw a Steven Spielberg movie, I was going to be scared because I was a little guy. And then I, I, I went to it because I knew that Han Solo was in it. And that opening sequence when they first actually show Ford and he whips the gun out of out of that native's hat or out of his hand, I looked at my brother and I said, Indian, I said, Han Solo has a whip. Han Solo has a whip. <laughs> had goosebumps. I have it right now telling the story. And I was completely dialed in. And Jason, you're obviously uh, very much a film aficionado and you, you've studied film. You've written screenplays. You write about them for WTOP. So you understand how movies work, how they're structured. What it was it that made Indiana Jones so different and why did it have such a big impact, do you think? Well, I mean, in terms of like a cinematic directorial, you know, technique standpoint of, of Steven Spielberg, um, I that just studying that opening sequence alone is, you know, right from when it fades in from the Paramount logo into the mountain. I'm like, all right, this, <laughs> this guy's uh, working on another level here. And um, it, it's easy to dismiss Spielberg as, you know, the maker of a, of popcorn entertainment. You know, I feel like he's as a director, sometimes that, you know, people don't hold him up in the, uh, you know, esteemed of like the elite auteurs or whatever, but they let's, mm -hmm. let's be serious. They, they, they said the same thing about Hitchcock back in the day. You know what I mean? Like they were like, yeah. Oh, he's just a popcorn you know master of suspense and only decades later once they dissected his movies over and over again they were like wow you know he he might be the greatest uh you know art filmmaker ever so i think spielberg will get his due 100 you go down 100 years from now people will look back and, and i think really 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 appreciate his movies but um in, in raiders specifically that opening sequence it is all you mentioned that moment where he he whips the the thing out of the guy's hand in the beginning when we first meet him it is all visual storytelling. Like we don't really have hardly any dialogue in the opening. It's more or less a silent sequence. There's a few lines in there, um, you know, throw me the idol. But but so much <laughs> so so much of it is um, using the image to to tell the story. Um, and uh, you know, even throughout, there's these great shots of him you know like you know uh silhouetted against sunsets when they're when they're doing the dig um you know over in the, in the middle east and uh or or when he first appears at uh, marion saloon there you know he appears like a shadow on the wall it, it almost looks like casablanca um yeah there, there's a lot of a lot of great you know filmmaking techniques but i really just think it's like that perfect marriage of art and entertainment. It is like a roller coaster ride nonstop. <laughs> we go on this ride with Indy throughout the whole movie. And um, I, I, I go back to, you know, uh, the idea that, that George Lucas was, was hot off of star Wars and, and Spielberg was hot off of jaws. And uh, well, I guess close encounters he had just done. And they're sitting there like on, on a beach in California around like 1980 or something. And Spielberg's like, Hey, you know, I want to direct a, a, a Bond film or something. And Lucas is like, no, 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 I got that beat. Let's, let's do, let's do this. Uh, you know, this Indiana Jones character. And uh, I think it was Indiana Smith. Originally. It was, it was. Yeah. And actually it was a Hawaii. That was a tradition. They always Hawaii. go to Hawaii. And right. he said, yeah, he had said Smith was so like, he was echoing your future film. <laughs> yeah. I didn't even know that at the time, but, uh, <laughs> but yeah, I, I really just think, yeah, we, we can cite the directing techniques all day, but like, I really do mostly think it's just, it is the quintessential example of like a popcorn entertainment ride. And, Kind of downright scary at the end for a kid with the when they start melting those faces and you know Harrison's Ford saying you know close your eyes don't look at it 
as a kid, we're kind of we want to, we're like maybe we should listen to him. And we're watching through parted fingers. You, know? <laughs> you, can't, you can't turn it away. And then of course the the great final uh, closing in the warehouse where top men are uh, watching over it. Uh, it belongs in a museum. He's been saying the whole time, and indeed it ends in it. It's that that itself is an homage to that final shot. Sort of, I think I saw Spielberg wanted to make it like that final shot in Citizen Kane where, at Xanadu, where you know where rosebuds amidst all that other of those treasures uh you know the end of raiders sort of ends with with uh you know the 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 ark of the covenant finally buried away um i just think it's great and and also you know what man like the the whole notion of these like biblical artifacts um i know they got away from it a little bit with the the stones in the second one but um in Raiders, it's the Ark. That's you can read the Old Testament and find references to that. Moses, you know, carrying the tablets, and uh, and then of course the Holy Grail, the Cup of Christ, and the third one, you know, penitent men. I think the way that they sort of tie all that in, and us looking for clues, and you know, Connery keeping a book of clues, it inspired so many things. I mean, um, gosh, romancing the stone, and then of course the Goonies, the Mummy, Tomb Raider, National Treasure. Um, Da Vinci Code, God, if you want to talk about biblical, you know, mysteries going from clue to clue, it inspired everything. Even what was it? What was it? My wife and I watching the other day. Um, there was a TV show, like some, some tales of the golden monkey or something or. Oh, there was. Well, also there's yeah. Legend of the Hidden Temple on Nickelodeon. <laughs> I mean, that's. Yeah. Uh, the DuckTales, Treasure of the Lost Lamp. I love that as a kid. It inspired mm. so much. And the other day, my, even that Zack Snyder, that um, the. Uh, Army, the Army of the Dead thing. Dead. There was in order to get to the big vault, there was like these little booby traps that they had to get through. That was so every it's so Indiana Jones. Uh it the the legacy lives on and on in so many ways. And um I know I know it's a throwback to a lot of like old serials that that used that Spielberg and Lucas used to watch, like some old a bunch of old cliffhangers, and they kind of put it all in a movie. But you know, so so some of that stuff predates it a little bit. Um, in terms of pop culture, I think it re- Indiana Jones in 1981 really set the course for every movie to follow. And you you mentioned a lot of great stuff. The 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 horror aspect certainly when Marion is trying to escape the Well of the Souls, and there's the frightening sequence with the skeletons and the and the snake coming out of the skeleton's mouth. I still have my son close his eyes for that part because it's very intense. It it picks and chooses from a lot of different genres, takes these tropes, but but kind of amps them up to a different level. But to me, what I, one of the things I've always liked about Indiana Jones, and it's especially prevalent in the original film, is that he's very self-effacing. He's not, I mean, he gets a kick out of what he's doing, but you never would necessarily know that because he just, he's trying to get the job done. He gets beaten up a lot. He seems like he's going to fail. It, it's never easy for him, but he never gives up. And I just find that so refreshing. Well, yeah, and he goes back to, you know, he's, get, like you're saying, he's getting beat up. He's, you know, he got in a, a, a scar on his chin from his whip. <laughs> we saw the origin of that with River Phoenix. But, but yeah, yeah, to your point, he's getting beat up by Nazis by day, and then he's in the classroom, you know, teaching to adoring students, batting their eyes afterwards. Um, he... Yeah, he he's a, he's an everyman. He's sort of just like a, a regular guy. He's like a less than perfect guy um, who you can tell deep down loves these priceless artifacts and wants to protect them. I mean, if if you put it on paper, if you didn't say this is an action adventure hero, but and you only quoted his you know his mantra as this belongs in a museum, that sounds boring and dry, right? But that's him. That is like that is like the golden rule that's driving him. And then you fi- find out that he's you know a globe trotting archaeologist. I mean, I I I'd, I'd love to see the number of uh, people that became archaeologists um, based on Raiders. Probably the same as that became paleontologists after Jurassic Park. <laughs> oh, honestly, I remember in uh, like seventh or eighth grade, I took a an archaeology uh, camp over the summer. Like, who knew there would ever really be such thing where we would, like go out in these these massive sand dunes and, and dig for bones that they had buried previously, like plastic bones and had to do all these little clues and stuff and studies of basically anthropology too. And it's, it's pretty cool how he's done that. He's, he's inspired a lot. You mentioned Spielberg and of course the John Williams score that you touched on to me, that entire score is, is just absolutely perfect. Oh yeah. Everyone remembers the Raiders arc, or the Raiders March, but I, um, you you forget you got to go through like your to your point you got to go through the whole soundtrack because miracle of the ark that is you know haunting and beautiful I mean, I mean, there's so many uh just 
moments of gold uh, throughout that soundtrack. Um, it's it gives you goosebumps. I think it connects. You know, it, I know in the fourth one it went away from it, it got a little more into the extraterrestrial type stuff. Um, but in at least in the original trilogy, it it really connects the supernatural and the biblical and the divine into our world with the highest of stakes. I mean, it's, it's Nazis. I hate these guys. Um, it's, it's literally the fate of the free world is, um, is at stake. You know, if, if Belloc and, and the Nazis get the arc, they can literally level mountains and, and all that stuff. So I, I love that. I love that they use the history to kind of set it up too. In the beginning, there's at least in part one and part three, there's that, there's always a scene um, with Indy and one of his pals, um, you know, usually Brody. <laughs> in the classroom we're drawing on chalk chalkboards about about these these various artifacts and then when when it becomes real and we see him go after it especially what's really cool too is when is when indian himself doesn't believe in it like in the third one he doesn't believe um in uh in in the holy grail it's something that is, that is only his dad believes in but throughout the journey throughout you know the going drilling down through the library into the knight's tombs and all this stuff he slowly comes to believe it and, you know, meeting all these protectors that have the tattoos on their chest that protect the grail. Um, it is just, man, it is, we go along for the ride because if you're, if you as a believer aren't, aren't or if you as a, a, a viewer aren't a believer in this stuff, dang it, by the end of the movie, you're going to be. <laughs> oh my gosh. It, there's, there's, it's a lot of, there's a lot of great beats. There's a lot of great storytelling and through it all. He's, he's like our guide. He's the every man. But but yet he's not because he's just got I don't know. I mean, my my I remember even my wife is not a big genre fan, but she, of course, supports and goes to all these movies. And when Raiders was out in theaters a couple of years ago, probably about eight years ago, again, for for a limited run, she just looked at me. And she goes, that guy is such a stud. I'm like, I know he is fantastic. Do you have a specific scene or sequence in Raiders of the Lost Ark? That's your favorite one that you do, even if you're flipping channels and it's on you like I have to watch this part uh yeah i mean i mean the i the most iconic of course is the opening with the boulder and everything so i mean if if i wanted to go with the 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 popular answer that's probably it and of course the end when they open it and the spirits come out um but i have uh my i'm not gonna go with those because that you know that would be a lame thing for your podcast I, my <laughs> um my two favorite parts my favorite thing is when you know he's already got the little medallion uh, and he puts it on the staff of Ra and he, re you know, he realizes the Nazis are, are digging in the wrong place and he puts the, he, he goes down and, you know, he, he goes down into the little underground room with the staff of Ra and only if it's at this exact height and the light comes through it, will it show the actual location of where the arc is. And uh, that just gives me goosebumps because there's that light that, 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 a light and twinkle in, in, in his eye that a smile comes over his face when he realizes they're digging in the wrong place. And the I music, know. it's just such a great yeah. storytelling blend. So I would say maybe probably that because they have the little map of the town, you know, the little middle Eastern area um, on the floor. I love that idea of only because I'm smart enough to find clue number a letter. A can I, interact with the friggin sun and uh <laughs> shine a light on where the next step is and because of that i'm gonna outwit you know the greatest evil ever i love that scene and then uh if i had to pick a uh so that's my favorite scene but if i had to pick one small little moment um it's when the scary nazi guy in the you know with, with the glasses and the black hat I, his name's escaping me a uh, tote but, is yeah. the character and the actor is a uh, is it paul no paul freeman plays belloc Ronald Lacey, I think. Ronald Lacey, yes, yes. Yeah, he's always dressed in black. Yeah. So like you probably know what I'm gonna say when uh -huh. you know when you, you think you know he you think he's gonna, you know, maybe kill Marion or something, but he holds his hand out for that little, you know, torture device and then he folds it into a coat hanger. I just <laughs> I think that oh, and then of course that little comic moment and then and then of course man, you know, one moment inspires another from in my brain. Uh when the big, you know, samurai guy in the street is wielding his sword and then Indy just pulls out a gun and, and shoots him. <laughs> so the, that movie could do comedy as well. And by the way, man, I think I know I'm going on and on, but I'm pretty sure that moment was um, due to uh, Harrison Ford being sick that day. Right. Yeah. Like he was supposed to be a big battle. And he was just he like, like why don't you shoot him? <laughs> dysentery or something. He was like, he couldn't hold any food down. He was terribly sick. He's like, can I just shoot the guy? And so they, they did a take with it. And. 
Even today, Jason, when I show this to my students, when I first introduced me to my son a couple of years ago, when that happens, everyone erupts in laughter because it's this movie is so good at the pacing and we're, we're just like gushing fanboys, but I'm okay. I mean, Raiders is my favorite movie of all time uh, just because of the sheer entertainment value. Even Spielberg says that of all his movies, that's the one that when he's watching TV, if that comes on, he will watch it wherever it's at to the very end because he just, he's able to just enjoy it, which is great. But it bounces action, very, very serious tension, uh, some very, very serious bad guys. But then it throws in elements of humor, a very Shakespearean really, to throw in humor at different moments to kind of lighten the mood. If I had to pick a moment, and all the ones you picked are fantastic. I mean, the, the film is just magnificent. But to me, that truck chase sequence and the stunt work on that and the, the building, the crescendo of John Williams' score to Indy eventually getting thrown out the front of the truck and, and that amazing stunt where he, he climbs underneath. What I try to emphasize to people is, look, one of the reasons this movie works so well, this is verisimilitude at its finest. This is real stunts. There's no CGI. Of course, the tech wasn't there per se, but it's all well choreographed, executed. All that stuff was shot second unit anyway. And Harrison, of course, was there as well. But that that to me is I don't think I'll ever see a, see a stunt sequence as great as that. No, and, and to, you're exactly right. It's visual storytelling and the practical effects rather than, you know, CGI. And you know what? I I actually miss that. And, you know, I not to sound you know, two two guys get off our lawn or anything because I love so many modern movies, action movies as well. Oh, but same. like, yeah. but like, I miss that even Spielbergian era. And you know, he 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 and Lucas, they, you know, they 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 were of a generation where they sort of studied the older masters. So I they they're doing it with the uh, um, you know that that truck sequence for that you mentioned. It's it's all carefully choreographed. It's you can tell it's it's panels of a storyboard brought to life. It is it's not. It's not this hyperkinetic, uh, you know, run and gun, shaky cam, uh, cinema verite, like like the Bourne movies, which which I love, by the way. They're, you yeah. know, Greengrass, it works for his own thing. Uh, Jason Bourne's great, but um, but I, but in terms of a visual style that I prefer, I miss I miss the days of those carefully storyboarded, um, you know, uh, easy to follow action sequences where it's like it's all visually all visually told every beat in that sequence you could show that to film students and be, or, or future directors and be like okay here here's where he goes through the windshield here's where he you know holds on to the front of the grate and it starts to break on the, on the front of the a bumper here's where he climbs underneath here's where he comes back and and cue cue the music dun, 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 dun. like it's people need I, I directors need to get back to that I, I want action sequences that are easy to follow again <laughs> yeah and, and they, like you like when he's getting dirty you feel like you're getting dirty it's just got it's just a par excellence so here's the thing you mentioned you mentioned all four films so if you had to rank them best to least favorite how would you rank them uh one three two four i would say and okay. one and, and i would say one and three like one a and one b to me like uh like i mentioned i mean last crusade was my absolute favorite as a kid and um and always will be uh, especially in, in light of and um in light of connery's death too it just brings even more of a you know of how lucky we were to see these two iconic you know figures on the screen together bantering i, I love it gives in indy a little bit more of a character arc um than in the first one and in the first one you know he, he does have he, he does go through a journey and you know and, and love interest and all that um but i think in part three we really start to see you know what's been driving him um on like a deep personal level is him trying to get out from under this this father figure who who you know, Indy didn't believe any of that. He he saw he saw a poor, you know biblical paintings on the wall as a as a child that his dad hung, where you know someone would be walking across a a a a, a, ca a, a chasm in a you know holding a grail, and he's like, that's just that's BS. I don't believe that. Oh, dad keeps this diary. He's insane with this little chicken crawl that he writes obsessively in this book. And then he, oh my God, he comes to realize that, you know, maybe dad had it figured out more than I, I realized. Um, and he was named after the dog. <laughs> but, um, but, uh, but yeah, so to answer your question, I, for the longest time as a kid, I would say my ranking would have been three, one, two, um, and, but I would say now I, I, I do, I do admit that I think it's in terms of just impact is one, three, two, and then, and then four. 
This is Vanessa Marshall, and you're listening to Coffee with Kenobi. With travel beginning to open up and Walt Disney World and Disneyland reaching full capacity, this is the time to book your Disney World vacation with MEI and Mouse Fan Travel. Their signature service and expert advice will help clients maximize their vacation time and dollar. I use Becky Mencken and MEI's incredible services all the time, both for family and for travel for the show because of their no cost, no obligation quote when you use the service. Plus, they proactively adjust the booking if the rate goes down. Literally, I will wake up one morning and I'll get an email from MEI saying that the price went down and I will get a refund sent to my credit card right away. I don't have to do anything. They help your family enjoy everything Galaxy's Edge and the Disney theme parks and the cruise lines have to offer. Can help you plan every detail and always share invaluable tips. That's for Walt Disney World, Disneyland, the Disney Cruise Lines, or other cruise lines. It doesn't have to be Disney related. They literally can help you plan a vacation anywhere on the planet. Be sure to go to www.coffeewithkenobi.com slash mousefantravel and sign up for a free no obligation quote to any of the Disney theme parks on the planet or any vacation that you have in mind. You'll have the best vacation possible and help out me and Coffee with Kenobi in the process. Believe it or not, I would go one, four, three, two. I love Crystal Skull. Oh, let's hear it. it. Yeah. So the the main reason I like Crystal Skull, first of all, just waiting. I think we had to wait 18 years between Indiana Jones films. But but first of all, I don't know how old he was. What is he in his late 50s when he made that movie? Probably. Uh, He looks fantastic. Uh, He's he's him. As soon as you see him on screen, he, he just... He just personifies that character still. They have fun with his age, but they don't make it. They don't. I feel like some of the more recent, like early fanboy criticism of Harrison Ford is borderline ageism. Maybe it actually is ageism. Let's let's give it a chance and see what happens. If anybody can do it, it's Harrison Ford. But the relationship that he has with the Shia LaBeouf character of Mutt very much is reminiscent in like a nice mirror image of his relationship with Connery in The Last Crusade. And I think they sell it beautifully. I think it works really, really well. There's some great interaction with them. And then anytime Harrison's on screen with Karen Allen, they have a very special chemistry. And when he tells her inside that truck, you know, he, she says like something like there's, I know there were a lot of women between uh, me and now. And he goes, well, there were, but they all had the same problem. And she said, what's that? And he said, none of them were you. And I just think that is such a great line. It even got me choked up. And you know, He's got heart, he's got soul, he's got guts, he can take a punch like nobody's business. But I, I love that movie and I love his relationship and how it mirrors Sean Connery's with him. So you weren't bothered. That's interesting. Um, it might be worth giving our list, listeners here go give it another look. Um, so you weren't bothered by the the infamous nuking the fridge and that kind of stuff? Not at all. I mean, I think I tweeted this the other day, but I mean, if, if you can watch Temple of Doom and, and he can jump out of a life raft... Oh, that thing's the most ab- absurd yeah. thing. Even, even it as doesn't a kid, even look like, good. come on. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you if we can buy that, if we can buy, I mean, this is Indiana Jones. I mean, in the first five minutes of the film, you should be dead. So you just have to roll with it. I mean, to me, when I when I watched it the first time, I didn't even bat an eye. And then the other criticism of the alien thing, I'm like, well, it's the it's the fifties. It's you know, it's it's the red scare. It's it's alien stuff. It's all stuff that George and Stephen watched when they were kids. That that would have that would have resonated with them. So. It would be weird if it didn't have that. Yeah, it's kind of like, how dare the director of E.T. and Close Encounters uh, want to put aliens in a movie? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know? how dare the guy who who created a billion-dollar franchise that has some aliens in it want to put an alien in his movie? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I, sure. I love it. I love it. Hey, man, no, that's that's a good perspective. I'm not gonna, you know, I'm not gonna rake you across the coals at all for that, man. Everybody has has their own favorites, but we if we agree. If, do we agree that 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 uh, that Raiders is is the top? Oh, Raiders is it's like I said, it's one, four, three, two. Raiders is not only the top, it's my favorite movie ever. I even rank it above any Star Wars movie. I love wow. Raiders. It's just, yeah, it's I mean, I... and but like I had one somebody say, Indiana Jones movies are like pizza. Even when they're not great, they're still better than anything else. For sure. Yeah, I mean, it's like with anything. A, it's all subjective, but B, I, yes. especially especially with these franchises. I mean, Indiana Jones. Star Wars and and I would th- throw in Back to the Future with if you want to have oh, some yeah. those three are like the iconic franchises of of you know the eighties era late seventies eighties uh, of of movie making and um, that we all grew up on and um, you know 
so much of it has to do with our childhood attachment to a certain film or not. And so for me, Last Crusade was was that movie. And then I doubled back to Raiders on VHS, like I said. So um, there wasn't like that emotional connection. It was it, for me, it was almost watching uh, like an origin story prequel that came out after in, in my own life's chronology. Do you know what I'm saying? Yes. So like so um, so for the longest time. And, and you know what? It kind of worked, too, because in, in the beginning of uh of last crusade you get the whole river phoenix you know playing indie as a kid and you get all the setups of where he got his whip where he got his hat where he got his scar on his chin you it, it kind of works as a standalone movie and i actually miss that in terms of movie making too like yeah even with the superhero movies a lot of which i love i feel like there is a certain point where you're like well i need to have seen at least some of these or i'm kind of lost of where we are in this avenger storyline um with 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 Indiana Jones and a lot of those old, uh, you know, franchises, um, you kind of could just pick up on any of the movies. You could watch Temple of Doom as a standalone and you would not, you know, you're not missing anything. And, and you could watch Last Crusade on its own and it feels like a complete experience. They ride off in the sunset. Cool. I, I watched him as a little boy in the beginning with River Phoenix and I watched him um, bond with his dad by the end. Boom. It was an, it's a nice, there's a catharsis, there's a closure. Um, but yes, the older I got, I would say Raiders because... And I always tell this to people, especially when I would teach film classes and I try to, you know, when I'm writing reviews for listeners, it's hard. You got to kind of put on the prism of of hindsight, of, of, of put yourself where it was in 1981 when it came out. So, like, it's easy mm -hmm. to to it's easy to cheer whatever sequel you want of any franchise, but you have to go back and give credit to that first one because none of those characters would exist. That theme music would not exist. That whole mythology, uh, that whole world, all the themes would not exist without that original. And so when you look on a best list and you see, you know, Raiders of the Lost Ark or the original Star Wars represented in the, the AFI top 100, and you're like, well, why isn't Empire in there? That was a better movie. Or why isn't Last Crusade in there or whatever? Pick your poison. But, um, there's a reason for that because a lot of these, a lot of list makers and film historians want to give credit to that first one. Plus, a lot of them lived through it and they remember that Raiders was the big phenomenon. They remember the the blockbuster, literal blockbuster, the lines around the corner, you know. So, um, I think we can agree that Raiders is the is the one that you would you would want to put in that in that box in the warehouse and in the you want to put that one in the museum. That's the one. <laughs> it does belong in a museum. Yeah, you, you Crystal. I mean. Last Crusade is a wonderful movie. You, the the Sean Connery, the fact that, like you said, that Sean Connery played and that James Bond played in the end, Jones's father's perfect. And it's great that Connery wasn't that much older than Harrison when he actually played it. And it just, it just works really great. It's too bad he wasn't able to come into Crystal Skull, but you know, it all worked out the way that was. And, and it's really hard to believe Jason, but they're actually, as we speak, shooting a new Indiana Jones movie right now. What do you think about that? They're doing part five and I've seen a couple, uh, photos from it I, i'm gonna avoid trailers I, I'm, a, I'm i'm not a trailer guy oh i appreciate them in hindsight but i feel like so many times they spoil the best bar, part so i usually wait mm -hmm. for the movies to come out um what do i think about it um i yeah i i feel like it's gonna get a lot uh, and you're already seeing it to, to your point you mentioned earlier you're gonna see a lot of the ageism against harrison again even more because he's older now even older um but you know what i i i don't know man i i I hate to say this because I know you're a big Crystal Skull guy. You ranked it too. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm pretty rare. <laughs> Part of the, the purest in me. What's well, my political answer? I'm going to come up with. No, the the uh, the um no. In all seriousness, is the the purest in me kind of wishes they would have left it in, in the 80s with with the, at the end of the you know original trilogy because it started sure. in it started in 81, um, ended in 89, took us through a whole decade. Um, and similar, you know, you could even argue the same with star Wars. It's like, it, there, there's so many of the, the, the other ones that I, that I love as well, but, um, the more recent ones, but, um, yeah. Or, or similar with the Godfather, like one and two, that's probably the greatest one, two punch in the history of, you know, movies. Like how, how many, how many movies can win best picture? Not only once, but twice. It's the only franchise where the original and the sequel one both won best picture. Um, so, but then they make part three all those years later. And, you know, it's kind of cool seeing Michael Corleone, you know, sort of his almost like a eulogy, him him trying to seek penance at the end of his life. But I guess my point is, is when you return to this years later with these actors and they're a lot older, um, you can, it's a cool way to continue the story, but it almost, to me, it lacks the magic a little bit. Um, but all that said, 
I can't fault anyone, especially like yourself, that wants to see them. And, you know, who, who, am, who am I to say? Uh, because it is a, it is an excuse for us to go explore that world again and explore these characters again. And you know what? Who are we to say? If Spielberg and Harrison Ford want to explore the magic of that world again, like, they, come on. They, they have, they've earned the right. To, you know, they, they can play that. You know James Bond's still going on, so who are we to say that 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 uh, Indiana Jones can't can't play you know a million roles until the day he dies? You know, like good sure. on them. <laughs> so you're the perfect person to ask this now that Spielberg, of course, we, he was so busy, still executive producing, but he's not directing this one, which is certainly bittersweet. But there is an opportunity for fresh eyes. Enter James Mangold. What do you think we can expect from a James Mangold directed Indiana Jones film? Well, James Mangold, I've sort of been a fan of him for a while. Um, what was the recent one? I oh, was he was Ford versus Ferrari. Yeah, um, I thought was was very very good with um, with uh, Christian Bale and Matt Damon the 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 uh, racing movie. Um, and of course, a lot of people. I know Logan was a little polarizing, um, but because it was very almost like an anti superhero movie, um, but a great but, movie. Right. I mean, it was it was up how many it was up for Oscars. The script was up for Oscars. So Mangold knows what he's doing. He did the 310 to Yuma re remake. So that almost that right there. And I love the original 310 to Yuma as well. Um, but I think that right there proves that he can take uh, an existing property and, and do something kind of interesting and, and modify it. Um, oh, God, we're, we're already forgetting uh, Walk the Line, too. I mean, he did. The oh, yeah. Um, so Joaquin Phoenix underrated. So, um, yeah, like. Uh, I think I think of of anyone you could pick. I, I I mean, hey, I think that's that's pretty cool. I mean, I think that's that's a really good pick. I mean, he's he's his style. I mean, it's not the same as Spielberg. They're both good storytellers. But but what is it about him that makes him stand out in Hollywood? Mangold. Um, I like kind of like what we were talking about with that with that truck sequence in Raiders. I think you you could put that up against like Ford versus Ferrari and see those similarly storyboarded uh action sequences. Like it's sort of like that old school vibe to action. It's he's a, and then you know I think I feel like it's a little bit more of a patient style which I mean I think non-fans of Logan would be like it was too slow or whatever or it was too not superhero -y enough with action. But I think I think that's that will serve the Indiana Jones thing well, and I've sort of already mentioned it. But right there, Logan, that's that's Wolverine. That's a famous character franchise. Um, and uh, uh, what was the other one we said? Oh, Three Ten to Yuma. That that's a beloved western. I think that shows that he can take these properties and and breathe new life into them. So, um, but yeah, go go watch the, the the final race sequence in Ford versus Ferrari and the emotional you know the emotional journey that he takes us on, where you know you think Christian Bale has has won the race, but then they got to, they got to pull, pull back uh, so that, so that the other member of his team can win. And then, uh, and then the, the catharsis, the tragedy in, in sort of the, the falling action epilogue. Um, yeah. I, th I think Mangold, uh, he knows he's a storyteller. He's not, he's not so concerned with, with the flashiness of everything. I think he's, he's sort of a guy, a little bit more of an old school vibe, which I, which I, which I like. I love that. And I, one thing, Logan is a great example because it's, it's a very visceral film, uh, but it's extraordinarily character driven, very, very introspective. In fact, all the movies you mentioned, especially Watson, on, they're all very character driven pieces. So I hope that we really get a chance to explore kind of what is going on underneath that fedora. Oh, I think so. Yeah. I mean, you mentioned Walk the Line um, it, you, and that they're character driven. You would think most, you know, you say Walk the Line, most people would probably think of him on him on stage performing you know Folsom Prison Blues or any of you know the famous songs of Johnny Cash but mm -hmm. the thing that stands out to me the first thing that pops in my brain when I think of Walk the Line is that shot of him with his on the razor blade where you know uh, uh what, what was it like I think his his brother was killed in a, in like a, a construction accident with a with the with a blade a power tool yeah, or something I, yeah I think so, that's yeah, right my, maybe it registered because my own grandfather was in a, a country band and he, until he cut off his thumb uh, on a saw, <laughs> he was a carpenter and he, that's how he's, that's why he had to stop playing. So maybe oh. that's why, but I'm going to go if it's because of, to your point, that it's a, that it's a character driven moment. It's not just a, in this case, it's just the indie uh, action sequences. I think he's hopefully man the character driven as, as his mantra. I love that. So I was actually had all these things ready to talk to you about Star Wars. But as we're going along, I'm just listening to you talk. I'm thinking, why don't I just have him on again to talk about Star Wars? I just, I just love talking movies with you. You talk movies all the time. I want to talk about your podcast. But before we let you go, I just want to ask you, what is it about 
what what is it about film that has become sort of like uh, a love language for you? Because I I love we talked about this before we talked about it on the show, but I love hearing you talk about film. Um, you know, for me, it was it was sort of the realization that it was uh, an art form. Like I because I grew up I I, I grew up with it as just an entertainment form. It was a roller coaster ride, and honestly, that's the thing that still drives me more than anything it's just you know that that pop a popcorn in and the lights go down or if you're at your house you know you turn your own lights down <laughs> but um uh you know just that anticipation of oh my god what's what the fun of this movie that's gonna happen um but then when you know the more and more i studied them and uh you know born in 84 i sort of was coming of age right around the turn of the millennium when they were when the afi and all these places were putting out these best lists and i remember just printing them all out and going down with the highlighter and being like what makes the great movies great man like i want to know i want to get into the dna of why these things are considered great um i remember just watching with like a with a remote control with a pause button and a notepad scribbling down like connery in his in his grail diary (laughs) and being uh and being like i want to figure out what this is and then i wrote all these like in-depth reviews way too long like hundreds of these analyses of classic movies maybe i was like maybe i'll put them in a book one day eventually i turned it into a website called the film spectrum um haven't updated it in like probably 10 years but um only ever posted like a hundred of out of like three or four hundred that i actually wrote i have them all sitting on this hard drive in, in the basement but um but yeah I, I i and i took some film classes too at university of maryland in undergrad and then again at film school when I got my master's at American University and I remember just looking at all these movies and the first time a professor um you know we'd watch he'd put a mo- put on a movie and we watch it for two hours and then you know we'd go take a bathroom break, break and come back for the lecture part and I'll never forget the first time it was John Ford's The Searchers just happened to be the movie and he was like all right well you enjoyed that movie now I'm gonna show you everything you missed in the first 10 minutes and there was this whole you know, romantic subplot um, on the ranch there um, about, you know, him, his brother-in-law and, and or his brother and the, his sister-in-law and the kids. And, you know, you're like, well, is he going on this search? Or could those actually be his kids? The, the ones kidnapped by the Comanches? And you're like, is there's, there's a whole, a whole other thing going on here based on how characters are grouped in the shots and, or John Wayne is sitting out on the porch but he's shooting through uh, the doorway and you see, you know, that just shows how, how he's distanced from this, the domestic life. He's destined to drift between the winds. Like he says about the native American characters, not to mention his whole, you know, racial prejudice journey that he goes on from the beginning. And at the beginning of the movie, he's in these Confederate grays and reds. And by the end, he's wearing union blues as he walks in that final bookend shot. So anyway, there was this whole, that just happened to be the movie. And then, you know, and then you you watch Citizen Kane in that class and, and you realize that, Oh my God, the, when when uh, Orson Welles walks, whenever he's feeling emotionally small, he walks deep into the frame in that deep focus photography. He goes really get he gets really small in the frame when he's feeling small, and then right when he's feeling confident again, he turns back and walks toward the camera, and he's getting big again. And I'm like, oh my god, there's this whole hidden language, almost like an Indiana Jones uncovering archaeology. I'm like, there's this whole hidden language that's working on our subconscious. And I know a lot of people can maybe dismiss that as, Oh, you're reading too much or, Oh, these are just Easter eggs that don't really matter. But no, I really, the Hitchcock's, I started being drawn to the Hitchcock's of the world where it, com- it married, it combined that childhood suspenseful roller coaster ride that I loved about movies from a childhood, but with this artistic, um, you know, sensibility that I started appreciating both in film classes in college, but also with my own just, hammering away on the craft with these notepads and best lists that I'm talking about. Like I started gravitating towards these filmmakers where I was like, you know what? To me, the best filmmakers are the Hitchcocks and, and, and when Spielberg was, was at his best too, with like a Schindler's list or private Ryan, you know, he, he could, he won director, best director twice too. So like, or jaws, I mean, you can go back and find great directorial stuff in that. So like I started being drawn to these filmmakers, you know, Billy Wilders, there's so many of them that are great, fun r- watches roller coaster rides on first watch but then when you go back again you can find all of these symbolic layers of you know the colors that, that are used in the shot selection and you know the they the film school would call it mise-en-scene of how you know symbol how the shot is sim- symbolically composed and um those are my those are my that's my jam um, I can appreciate movies that are just popcorn watches. Some of these superhero movies are just fun, but maybe there aren't these symbolic layers all the time. 
And then I can also appreciate, you know, maybe like the Fellini stuff and some of the, you know, other stuff that are like eight and a half that is way out there, but, uh, and you can appreciate it on an artistic level, um, but that they're, you know, you're not going to sit down and show it, show it to your kids on a Friday night. So the, I d- developed this notion that there is a film spectrum. There's art and entertainment. There's the audience and there's critics. You can even see that reflected on Rotten Tomatoes. But I really, my philosophy, my mantra has always been, I think the best movies, the all-time greats that we return to again and again are the ones that sort of marry those two and can walk that line um, to steal a man gold term. <laughs> um of of art and entertainment i really do like it's a wonderful life uh everyone thinks it spielberg calls it a five hanky movie uh you know it's an an emotional mainstream powerhouse that we watch every christmas um Mm. but but you go you put it on and you see george bailey with with clarence the angel at the fire you know uh, after he's jumped out and to save him out of the water and you see that there's this clothesline a diagonal clothesline that frank capper uses across the flame the frame where George Bailey is sitting under the clothesline and Clarence is standing above the clothesline. And you're like, oh my God, in this one image, we have the immortal and the mortal worlds. We have Jimmy Stewart down here in the mortal world and the angel above the clothesline. I just, and that's in a mainstream movie. Sorry, I'm getting all excited, but I, I, I genuinely love that there's another language at play that the great directors laced all the symbolic layers in, a, in an otherwise mainstream movie i freaking love it and so raiders i could sit and talk raiders with you all day man i i uh i love movies <laughs> oh please do not apologize this is exactly why people need to listen to beyond the fame podcast i mean that yeah, this is fantastic stuff and look i'm a t- i'm a literature teacher during during the day i i love to me you've got you know entertaining you know you like you pop the popcorn movie versus the art house and sometimes the two blend together beautifully uh, there are there are a number of great examples of that, but I like a good story. I like a good story told. I like layers. I like being. I like thinking. Part of the fun is really dissecting it and breaking it down. So, if you ever have an online class or I'm in the DC area and you're and you're lecturing, I'm there, buddy. I'm in the front row. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, like I re- the real the masterpiece is that rise to the top. And if people mm. want to know why certain movies make the best lists and are esteemed by critics, it's because that yes, they, they work the first time you watch them, but it's because the directors and a lot of, sometimes the screenwriters, sometimes they write this into the script some visual stuff in the script too. Um, they, they've thought it out and are like, you know, those drapes are yellow for a reason. Um, the, you know, vertigo is using red and green for a reason, mortal and eternal. There's, I don't know any, any of the great things you could list. Like I, I I really urge people to not dismiss it as, Oh, that's, that was by accident. And I think the key is to see if it's like a pattern in its own movie. Like, yeah, maybe the drapes are just yellow if it's in there once and has no meaning, but um, you might be like, well, Dan might be onto something if you see it multiple times throughout the movie. And, and it like, it proves the rule. You know, there is some symbolic thing that happens in in Fargo. The Coen brothers are shooting William H. Macy, Jerry Lundergaard, through these vertical blinds like jail bars because you know literally the law is closing in on him as he's fudging his numbers at his car dealership like okay maybe that is that is that just by chance oh actually no it happens multiple times in this same pattern throughout the movie and the coens are a genius uh the drapes are yellow multiple times in dan's great masterpiece he did it on purpose (laughs) so like i i think that yeah like if if it happens multiple times i think you can start to be like uh, or maybe there's something to this again. But again, man, it's it's art. It's it's like we're at an art museum studying a painting. It could all be just by accident. And sometimes the filmmakers would be. I've interviewed filmmakers where um, they're like, "Oh, I actually didn't mean that," <laughs> but it's there. It's it's captured on screen, and we get to to pick it apart and dissect it. And uh, and that's what I love about it. And um, mm. just on the Fame podcast today, we had George Stevens Jr. I, I put it, it was an old interview I did years ago, but you know he founded the American Film Institute. His dad was George Stevens. You know he made Giant and Shane and A Place in the Sun and all those movies. And um, uh, I bring it up because George Stevens Jr. wrote these books where he interviewed all the great filmmakers ever. He interviewed Frank Capra, he interviewed uh, William Wyler and Alfred Hitchcock and Billy Wilder, Wilder and Frank Capra, all these guys. And uh, it was called conversations with the great movie makers of Hollywood's golden age. And um, I, I just, I just ate that like catnip because you hear these directors literally saying, 
uh, yeah, actually, that thing was intentional. That that symbolic thing was intentional. So I think I think we need to give filmmakers more credit, and I also think we need to give audiences more credit. I think audiences are up to the challenge and the benefit of the era we live in now. Is everything's at our fingertips? You know, you can pull up Bonnie and Clyde as fast as you can. End game, like everything's there right at our fingertips, and uh, you can hit pause, you can dissect it, take notes figure out these symbolic things, uh, but also don't forget to sit back and, and enjoy the ride like Raiders. <laughs> exactly. Listening to Coffee with Kenobi, you are with Dan Z, the podcast you're looking for. This is... <laughs> As we near the end of the show today, I want to thank each and every one of you for taking time out of your busy schedule to have a cup of coffee with me and for helping to spread the word about our Star Wars family we've got here at Coffee with Kenobi. Be sure to tune in Monday nights at 8 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time on Facebook Live at www.coffeewithkenobi.com slash live or www.facebook.com slash coffeewithkenobi and have a cup of coffee, tea, or any beverage of your choosing with me as we continue the conversation. To join us in the CWK Cafe, which is our Facebook group, and share your Star Wars thoughts, comments, reviews, and opinions in a family-friendly, spoiler-free place that is also drama-free. Go to www.coffeewithkenobi.com slash community and be part of the conversation, talk about this week's show, or just talk about some Star Wars. We have a lot of fun, and you'll make some new friends as well as catch up with longtime friends along the way. I also want to thank all of the new and longtime members of the CWK Alliance and let you know how much I appreciate your help and encouragement. If you want to join the CWK Alliance, go to www.cwkalliance.com and sign up today. Not only will you help out Coffee with Kenobi, but you also get access to CWK Pour Over, the exclusive weekly podcast not heard anywhere else. It's a great way to support and help out the show, and 10% of your monthly contributions go directly to to the St. Jude Children's Hospital to support the incredibly important work they are doing to help these brave children and their families. Plus, contributors at the CWK All-Star level can watch a video podcast of CWK Pour Over hosted by me, Tom Gross, and Corey Club. Feel free to reach out anytime if you have any questions. In addition to being part of the community on Facebook, please don't forget to visit our website at www.coffeewithkenobi.com for Star Wars news, announcements, reviews, videos, and so much more. If you have a question for me or just want to share your thoughts on the air, feel free to email me at danz at coffeewithkenobi.com and I'll share them on the show. You can also connect with me on Twitter at Mr. Zare, M-R-Z-E-H-R, or on Instagram at CWK. There are also a lot more ways to connect with me and Coffee with Kenobi on social media. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram. Give us a like on Facebook at facebook.com slash coffeewithkenobi. Check us out on Pinterest or subscribe to our Coffee with Kenobi YouTube channel. On our YouTube channel, you can find Facebook Live video, different interviews throughout the years, highlights of video coverage throughout the Coffee with Kenobi history, and the audio podcast itself. You can order my book, The Star Wars Book, which I co-wrote with Lucasfilm's Pablo Hidalgo and Cole Horton on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Target, Books A Million, Walmart, or anywhere books are sold. You can also find my writing on Coffee with Kenobi's website, as well as StarWars.com, where I am an official blogger there, and on IGN, where I contribute occasionally to articles about Star Wars, as well as other popular culture topics. If you are considering starting a podcast or a blog, let me know how I can help you get started and make your creative vision a reality. Be sure to check out DanzyMedia.com and we can get the process started. I am also available to come to your school, conference, business, or organization to talk about how to tap into your strengths and help you bring out your very best. I want to inspire you to be inspired so you can take that first step into a larger world. Thanks, as always, to our Coffee with Kenobi sponsors, especially MEI and Mouse Fan Travel, our travel partner, and your one-stop shop for all things Walt Disney World, Disneyland, the Disney Cruise Lines, or anywhere on the planet you want to go on your vacation. Please go to www.coffeewithkenobi.com slash Mouse Fan Travel to book your magical vacation and help support Coffee with Kenobi in the process. If you like the show, please tweet out that you're listening, share it on Facebook, or invite your friends and family to tune in and share a cup of coffee with us. 
And if the force is especially with you, please take a couple of minutes to rate and review the show on iTunes or Google Podcasts. Every review makes a huge difference and helps to spread the word. And I can't thank you enough for your help, for your support, and your friendship. I love so much being a part of this wonderful Star Wars community, and I can't thank you enough for all that you do for me and Coffee with Kenobi. Man, there, there's so many great things to talk we could, we could, Man, we should start our own podcast. Dan and Jason <laughs> right. talk movies. Well, speaking of podcasts, you mentioned Beyond the Fame. Please let everybody know about your podcast, where they can find it, and where they can reach out to you and connect with you on Twitter. Yeah, uh, the podcast on Twitter is called, um, it's at fame underscore podcast you can just search you know beyond the fame on any podcast apps uh i'm I'm an iphone guy so literally you know just hit your hit your purple podcast icon there and search beyond the fame with jason fraley it'll pop up it's got a red logo can't miss it um i've been trying to upload it almost every day uh so um just all these a treasure trove of like a decade of conversations with different uh not just filmmakers sometimes a lot of musicians on there too um, but yeah, uh, it's beyond the fame with Jason Fraley, anywhere you get your podcast. And then my day to day stuff at WTOP is at J Frey WTOP. So J F R A Y W T O P. Uh, those are the Twitter handles. Um, and, uh, yeah, and you can find, find my, you know, I'm posting reviews and articles like multiple times a day on WTOP.com on the entertainment page. So lots of places you can, can find me, but none, none as cool as, as coffee with Kenobi. Man. Like, I feel like, I feel like you are the Obi-Wan right now. And I'm just like the, you know, your pupil. I'm, I'm Luke Skywalker and you're Obi-Wan. Well, Luke, you've done a heck of a job, buddy. <laughs> uh, it's, it's been an absolute pleasure and a delight to have you on the show and definitely be sure to follow Jason on Twitter. He's, he's a great follow. He's always talking movies and pop culture and i learn a lot from his twitter account i've certainly learned a lot about film tonight so love to have you on the show anytime my friend absolutely we'll come back again and we'll, we'll do star wars this podcast is not endorsed by the walt disney company or lucasfilm limited it is intended for entertainment and informational purposes only the official star wars website can be found at www.starwars.com star wars all names sounds and any other star wars related items are registered trademarks and or copyrights of disney and their respective trademark and copyright holders all original content of this podcast is the intellectual property of coffee with kenobi unless otherwise indicated this is the podcast you're looking for Come on.